Greetings, this is Greg. I want to address some repeating questions and remarks coming up in the comments section on this channel. These mostly relate to World War II aircraft and weapons. Rather than put up the related photos, which are already in other videos, I thought I would use some DCS footage as filler. I'm taking off against the traffic here, so I have to be careful. Today I'm flying an FW-190A8 on DCS. We're taking off from the Carpaque airfield on a multiplayer server. It's the Wolfpack server. To start the takeoff, I'm going to give it full right rudder, stick all the way back to lock the tailwheel slightly to the right to counteract the torque effect as the plane comes off the ground. I go to full power, and as we get going faster and faster, I can take rudder out of it, and I'll need less and less as we roll down the runway. At 150 kph, so right there, I move the stick to the neutral position, fore and aft, and then the plane will just about fly itself off the ground. I retract the gear right about now, as soon as there's not enough runway left to land on in front of me. And once we're above 250 kph, I retract the flaps. I'm looking around, checking for traffic, and I exit the traffic pattern with a right 45 degree turn here. By modern airspace rule standards, this is completely incorrect. Should have made a left 45 degree there, but uh, that's okay. I'm keeping my eyes out for traffic. There's a friendly, that's great. I know right away he's not an enemy, because if he was, there'd be any aircraft fire headed in his direction. So, at this point, I want to start heading to another place where I'll have friendly anti-aircraft fire in case I get jumped while I'm climbing out. Also, this may provide me the opportunity to attack an enemy. So we're going to head for the German rail yards at Cannes, which are just off to the left. You'll see them in a moment. There's some smoke coming from there. So again, that may provide me a target of opportunity, or if I get jumped by enemy fighters, it'll provide me with some anti-aircraft fire. Now, in this video, I want to talk about uh, German cannons, Soviet cannons, the P-47 Thunderbolt's range and dive speed limitations, the origins of North American, and if I get to it, some general thoughts on Soviet aircraft performance specs versus real-world performance. These things are all subjects I've talked about at length, and I've provided the receipts for them for my opinion in their respective videos, so I'm not going to do that again here. I'm just going to talk about things in fairly general terms. Now, before I took off here, I asked if anyone on the Wolfpack server would meet me over Sword Beach for some 1v1 action for purposes of this video. And nobody, nobody seemed to want to do that. And then I thought, well, you know, that could be because nobody knows where Sword Beach is, which got me thinking. Since we are on the Normandy map, this would be a great time to do sort of a tour of all the key D-Day beaches and the key D-Day invasion places. Uh, some of the things from the where the paratroopers landed in the series Band of Brothers, and the main beaches, and some other things. So we're going to take a look at all of that. So right now we're heading out over the German rail yard at Cannes, and we're heading to Sword Beach. It's just right by my left inboard cannon there. We'll be there soon enough. Let's get to the main subjects I want to talk about. I want to start off with the German cannons and specifically their thin-walled shells they were using or what were often called mine shells, M-I-N-E. In a previous video about the Soviet IL-2 Sturmovik, I mentioned that I thought the Germans went nearly all in on cannons with thinly walled shells, the mine shells, because they were facing the Soviet Air Force which was made largely of wood, and high explosives are very effective against wooden airplanes. Quite a few viewers said this can't be the case because the Germans had been converting to cannons for some time, way before the war. That's true, but the difference is in the mine shells. I was specifically talking about cannons with mine shells, and most of you understood that, but there was a group of people who didn't. It's true that nearly every nation was mounting cannons on their planes by 1940 or so, at least on some of their planes. However, the typical Allied 20mm shell had about the same armor penetrating capability as a US 50 caliber machine gun round with the addition of some explosive power. The German mine shells were very different. They had relatively little armor penetrating capability, 
but a lot more explosive power, typically about 70% more, exactly what you want if shooting at wooden airplanes. So I hope it's at least clear now what we're talking about. It's not just cannons, it's cannons with mine shells. The second reason for objecting to my theory seemed to relate to the dates involved. The mine shells were first used in German fighters during the Battle of Britain, and some seem to think that means they were in use because they were fighting the RAF and were not even at war with the Soviet Union at the time. However, the Germans began seriously planning for what would become Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union in late July of 1940, which was during the Battle of Britain. It stands to reason, and frankly it's only common sense, that they wouldn't wait until Barbarossa started to try out these shells in combat. Let's talk about some of the invasion beaches for a moment. Sword Beach is immediately to our left. Now the shoreline here is running more or less east and west, and so we're going to be turning and flying more or less westbound as we tour these beaches. Immediately to our left is Sword Beach, and Sword Beach butts up against the canal that goes to Khan. You can see the canal there, and that's Sword Beach immediately off my left wingtip right now. Now a little bit farther westbound, off the wingtip about now let's say, is Juno Beach. It's all one contiguous beach, that is Sword and Juno are. Now Sword Beach was invaded by the British, Juno Beach was invaded by the Canadians, so logistically they're divided up, but in terms of uh, the actual geography, Sword and Juno are essentially one beach. Casualties on those two beaches was just under 2,000 on D-Day, which represents just under one-fifth of total Allied casualties on that day. Let's go back to our cannon discussion. Remember, we're talking about the reasons that people object to my theory that the Germans went with cannons with mine shells, primarily because they were fighting the Soviets. The third argument stems from the fact that the Royal Air Force did have some wooden airplanes at that point. However, they had far more airplanes made of metal, and the combat airplanes made of metal were far more threatening. If going up against the RAF in 1940, you probably wouldn't choose to optimize your firepower for wooden aircraft. Now eventually, the RAF of course did have the Mosquito, which was made of wood, but that was later. And the Luftwaffe's problem with shooting down the Mossy was primarily in finding them and catching them, not in effectiveness of ammunition once they caught up to them. The introduction of the mine shells corresponds almost perfectly with the planning of the invasion of the Soviet Union. I will occasionally see comments suggesting that the Germans went with heavy cannon armament and also mine shells in their fighters because they had to face American forage and heavy bombers. That argument just doesn't hold water because the Germans were going with this type of armament well before the four-engine heavy showed up. Now it turned out, and fortunately for the Germans, that these weapons worked very well against four-engine heavies because those planes weren't really as heavily armored as people think. So high explosives was favorable to armor penetrating ammunition when you're shooting at a B-17 or a B-24. But again, I don't think they went with these cannons because they somehow anticipated that threat. That just doesn't seem reasonable to me. And the cannons had to be set up to fire one type of shell or the other. So the cannons that were firing mine shells could not fire more conventional cannon shells like the uh, Allies were using. That's important to keep in mind. And they certainly weren't going to be able to switch from one type to the other in the middle of the war. They had all sorts of logistical challenges and production issues at that point. All right, so we're continuing along and about now we're opposite of Gold Beach. Gold Beach is separated from Sword and Juno by a canal. Hopefully we'll look over there. Yeah, that's, you can, that's Gold Beach right off the wingtip right there. Gold Beach was another British beach, and casualties there were pretty significant. They totaled about 1,000, so uh, certainly not light casualties, but could have been a lot worse. The Germans, while not really well prepared for the invasion of Normandy, did put up a pretty good defense, and at every one of these beaches they ran into considerable resistance. Let's take a look at a map so people can get a big picture of where we are. 
and I'll zoom out and scroll up so we can see the southern coast of England there to help orient you. We're going to be taken off from Carpaquay. I'll use the mouse cursor to show you the route. We'll go from Carpaquay north, then more or less westbound along the Normandy shoreline, down to Carrington. There was a lot of action there just post E-Day, and then I'll land at Lingerols. You may recall we only took off 50% fuel because I anticipated a dogfight fairly early on, but 50% should be enough to get me through this whole route, especially because, as you can see, at this hour there were so few people on the server. So, if all goes according to plan, I'll be able to complete the route. Now, of course, as you guys know, nothing ever really goes quite according to plan. Off the left wingtip here, you can see these cliffs. Much of the Normandy shoreline is comprised of cliffs. In fact, when you look at Normandy with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, it's pretty obvious where the Allies were going to come ashore because there are only so many places that that can realistically be done. To close out this talk about mine shells, I'll say that the Luftwaffe was the only Air Force to use mine shells or shells of this type in significant numbers for air-to-air -air combat. I think it's because the Luftwaffe was the only one facing an enemy with an Air Force primarily made of wood. That's my theory, and I think it fits the dates and all the other facts quite well. Of course, you can feel free to disagree. I need to talk about Soviet cannons as well, but I want to hop into a MiG for that part of the talk, which I'll do later in this video. Next up, I want to go over the P-47 dive speed issue that keeps coming up in my comment section, specifically its mock limitations. However, we're moving pretty fast here in our FW-190, so I'll have to talk about Omaha Beach next. You know, maybe I made a mistake with this format. I might be trying to do too much here. Let me know in the comments. We're moving pretty fast here. In fact, we're already abeam Omaha Beach. Now, anytime you see a documentary or a movie about D-Day, it will typically focus on Omaha Beach. This was primarily an American affair. Casualties at Omaha Beach were very high, between five and 6,000. Roughly half of all the Allied casualties on D-Day happened here. A lot of things went wrong, it's just too complicated to get into in a short summary or video tour like I'm doing here. The next thing we're going to come up on is Point du Hoc. Point du Hoc is a little strip of land that sticks out into the sea, and it was pretty well defended, and it's atop cliffs, so U.S. Army Rangers didn't have a beach to go ashore there. What they did is they scaled the cliffs. A number of things went wrong, way too much to talk about in this video. But uh, this, it was pretty impressive that the Army Rangers were able to pull this off. Although at one point, the outcome was seriously in doubt, and the U.S. Navy considered sending Marines ashore to help out, although that never happened. The Army soundly said no. Notice all the bomb craters down there right around the point? That is historically accurate. The U.S. bombed the heck out of that prior to the assault. The reason you don't hear much about Point de Hoc is because a lot of French people were executed by the Americans because it was thought that they were assisting the Germans and providing artillery spotting and that sort of thing. So it's sort of a touchy spot in history. Now, ahead of my right outboard cannon there is Utah Beach. Now, if everything went wrong at Omaha Beach, everything went just swimmingly at Utah Beach. U.S. B-26s pounded the heck out of the defenses there, and U.S. forces ran into less resistance at Utah Beach than in a lot of the other locations. In fact, there are groups of U.S. soldiers that lost more troops, had greater casualties training to hit Utah Beach than they actually lost when they were attacking Utah Beach on D-Day. Back to the simulator, I'm diving to look for some enemy aircraft. I'm right between two allied bases deep in enemy territory. Plus, with the radar reports, I know there are enemy aircraft down here, so I want to find them and engage them in a dogfight. Now, that's not necessarily the best idea in a 190A8 in DCS. The A8, as represented in this simulator, is very accurate, but it's representing an A8 from early 1944, and it doesn't have quite the capability as a late 1944 variant, and you're really in trouble if you're one versus one against a P-51. And once you engage a P-51 in the A8, you're in a fight to the death because you can't run away. And he can outmaneuver you, outclimb you, outdive you. Uh, you have a little bit better roll rate, but that's about it. And it's hard to parlay that alone into a victory. So keep that in mind. If you want a dogfight from the German side, 
the best choice is the 109K4, no question about it. Now, if what you want to do is shoot down a lot of enemy airplanes and always return to base safely, your best choice among the German aircraft is the 190 Dora 9. Normally, when I shoot down five airplanes or even ten airplanes sometimes in a row without being shot down myself and getting back to base every time, I'm always flying a 190 Dora 9. It's very good at that. But it also it means it's a little bit boring to fly it that way. You've got to fly around for a long time to find the right target of opportunity. You spend a fair bit of time running away. It's not really all that much fun. But the Dora can be fun, and it does have a lot of potential to get those high kill ratios. I think this is a beautiful paint scheme on my Anton. I really like it. Now, so what is the Anton good for? It's not really good in a one versus one dogfight. What it's good for is winning the war, so to speak. Keep in mind it's a simulation, and I'm talking about within the rules of the Wolfpack server. There are bombers that come in, B-17s at high altitude. Well, the 190A8 is much better at destroying uh, B-17s than either the Dora or the 109K4. So it's the best German plane for that. It's also by far the best German plane for ground attack. And ground attack's important because not only are there are allied forces on this map to de destroy, but if you knock out all the defenses at an enemy airfield, it becomes your team's airfield. So ground attack, bombers, and fighters. Well, as they say, two out of three ain't bad. And the Anton is the best choice among the German airplanes for two out of three. Furthermore, you can dogfight with it, just be aware if you enter a fair and square dogfight against a pilot that's even close to your skill level in any of the allied fighters, you're really going to have a tough time with it. Let's talk about the P-47 for just a moment. I need to get that in. That's one of the main reasons I'm doing the video is to answer comments that come up all the time. So in my P-47 Thunderbolt series on this channel, I have an entire video about the plane's dive performance. I'll put a link to that video in the description. And there I use what I think are the highest possible sources to support the numbers that I give. Uh, these sources are the aircraft flight manuals from the manufacturer, various reports from NACA, some of which are from different teams of researchers in different areas of the country in different times. I use at least one British report on the plane and statements from Robert S. Johnson, who not only was a leading ace in the P-47, he was the chief test pilot for Republic aircraft. I literally put pages from those reports on screen showing the Mach limits. The highest Mach limit in the pilot manual works out to 0.775. NACA tested the plane to Mach 0.82 or 0.83 depending on the source and tested controllability up to about 0.78. I actually said in the earlier video 0.76, but I show on screen it was 0.78, I just misspoke. Now, above 0.78, the efforts were only on recovering from the dive. So the sources I put up show that the Thunderbolt could reach Mach 0.78 and maneuver at that speed, at least to some extent, with a maximum Mach limit around 0.82. I don't think these Mach numbers can be disputed because all the sources I used are the highest possible level and are largely in agreement with each other. Yet some people in the comments constantly bring up statements by British test pilot Eric Brown. Some have even accused me of calling Eric Brown a liar, which is absolutely false. So let me clear this up. In one hand, I have Republic Aircraft, the Royal Air Force's Air Fighting Development Unit, NACA at both Langley, Virginia and at the Ames Research Center in California, and Robert S. Johnson, Republic Aircraft Test Pilot and European Theater Ace, all saying pretty much the same thing in regards to dive speed and Mach limitations. In the other hand, I have people telling me that Eric Brown said its Mach limit is down around 0.71. Here's the thing. That's not exactly what Eric Brown said. He said that the, quote, tactical Mach limit, unquote, is 0.71. You see, tactical Mach limit is something that Eric Brown and or people he was working with made up. It's not the same thing as the Mach limit or the critical Mach number. As far as I know, it's never been referenced before or since in regards to World War II fighters. The tactical Mach limit, as described by Eric Brown, 
required some entirely arbitrary and subjective degree of maneuverability at that limit. We'll get back to the Eric Brown saga in a minute. I see a P-51 Mustang down there. I want to narrate this. Now, he's seen me. I know that because he's reverse direction, so fight's on. At this point, I could still turn and run for home. It would take him a long time to catch me with my current speed and altitude advantage, but I don't do this. I'm going to press the fight, even though he's seen me, which is kind of a bad idea. But if I can hit him before he gets his guns on target, the firepower of my 190 should do some real damage. Unfortunately, I missed there. So what I'm going to do is climb back up and try and come back around on him. I have a pretty good energy advantage, and as long as I keep that, I'm going to be able to play this game of keep my speed up, do sort of a Shondell type turn, come back down on him, and, and open fire. And this time, I've opened fire with everything, all four cannons, both machine guns, which is typically what I do. And I get some rounds on target here. They're not great hits, but I definitely got some hits, and that's a great start. I'm going to pitch up and try and do the same thing, but now my energy status is getting lower and lower, and as this fight continues, the advantage is going to go more and more towards the Mustang, because he'll be able to maintain his energy more effectively. And in fact, you can see I'm struggling with some wing rocking and shuddering, that means I've got the plane at the performance limit, and I was not able to get my guns on target. He almost was. He got some rounds there, and they were pretty close. He wasn't quite able to line up, but that shows that the energy fight is moving in his direction. That's a very bad sign. Here, I'm really fighting the airplane, and there's just no way I can get my guns on target, and he can, so that's bad. Thankfully, he misses. At this point, I'm going to try and build up some more speed, and I look behind me, and I see him, and then I look behind me again, and I see him, and he's really close, and I'm thinking, how did he get turned around that fast and get moving that fast and still have enough, all this energy to go into this climb? What I didn't realize here is that right now I'm looking at a second airplane. I uh, reviewed the footage of this fight in detail and also went over it in tack view, but at, so now narrating this after the fact, I know what's going on, but at the time I was pretty confused here. So I went into that dive a moment ago to build up speed, to pitch up, and try and get my guns back on him, and now I'm looking at two airplanes, and I'm thinking another friendly has joined the fight. Hooray, I'm saved. But no, it's two P-51s, but they don't seem to be maneuvering against me. Turns out what happened is that this one, which is the first one, the one I started the fight with, has misidentified the second P-51, and thinks that that airplane is me, or at least another uh, German aircraft. The P-51 that entered the fight second is flying a green paint scheme with white markings, and my 190 is in a green paint scheme with some white markings, so I understand the confusion here. This is an easy mistake to make. But the first pilot realizes it. He breaks off. I, I almost got some shots on him. I didn't hit him, but that was a good example of why I don't like to use tracers. That gave me a little bit of extra time. And meanwhile, while he's trying to get a situational awareness back, decided I'd go after the second guy to enter the fight. And I lined this up reasonably well, but I don't think I got any hits there. I did review tack view. I don't remember what it was. Now, what this Mustang pilot should have done is just gone into a maximum rate turn and let his speed settle down at the point which is ideal for the P-51's maximum rate. And had he done that, I would have never got my guns on target. He would have come back around, and either he or his... Uh, his buddy would have killed me, but that's not what happened. He relies on these sort of jinking vibr uh, variations, sort of monkey motion going on, and that's really effective if you've got a 109 behind you, because it's hard for the 109 to hit you when you're doing that. But against a 190, he should really just be going into a turn. The other P-51 just went by in the other direction, so I know I don't have much time before he's back in the fight. Uh, again, the first Mustang's doing all this jinking, and that's pretty effective, but... Uh, I'm getting some hits now, and it's hard to hit a plane that's doing this, but there we go. We got some good hits, hit his cooling system, that's causing that white steam to come out. That's wonderful. And furthermore, you see how that white steam just stopped? Now, I know a P-51 has no way to isolate a leak in the cooling system, so that means he just ran out of coolant and is not much of a threat at this point. However, tracers just went by, I just took some hits. So I'm going, to, going into a hard turn to deal with that original 51, and I see a big splash behind me. 
attack view revealed after the fact that that is in fact the splash from the first P-51 that we damaged. So whether he went in due to damage or whether it was a maneuver kill, I'm not sure. In either case, I got credited for it, so good job for me. I don't know where that other P-51 is, but frankly, I'm not worried about him. I don't think he's going to get back to base with no coolant. Maybe he will. Turns out he didn't, so I got credit for both of those P-51 kills, which you will probably see on the scoreboard later. My primary concern now is keeping my speed up. Fortunately, my engine is undamaged. My only damage is to the left wing, and it's, it's detracting from the airplane's flying quality slightly. Not enough to be a big concern. My bigger concern is getting back to base safely. There's an enemy airbase to my right, an enemy airbase to my left. There are allied ships out here. If any of these things fire at me, it's going to, well, it could shoot me down, but more significantly, it could give away my position. And I'm concerned that allied aircraft could have figured out where I'm going. It would be reasonable for them to assume that I'm going to head for linger rolls, and thus they know more or less where I'm going. So I'm staying down on the deck to stay out of radar. I'm also going to be very hard to spot with the camouflage of the 190 uh, against the terrain. So I'm pretty confident at this point I'm going to be able to avoid enemy aircraft, but I am very worried about it. That's why I'm looking around so much. Notice we're at 1.42 ATA, that's manifold pressure in units of atmosphere, doing about 550 kilometers on the deck, cowl flaps fully closed. In the 190A8, in DCS and in real life, not by the book, but again, in DCS and in real life, you can run this manifold pressure setting in this airplane all day long as, you don't, as long as you don't let the engine overheat. Now, if we had the higher settings available to us, which I wish we had, but we don't, which are 1.58 and uh, 1.65, we could get a lot more performance out of this airplane, but those settings are pretty seriously time limited. So the name of the game right now is keep the speed up, watch for enemies. There are enemies behind me. I'm not sure if you can see them on YouTube, but I could see the dots in the background there. I know that they're back there. I'm not sure if they're pursuing me or not. So in a few moments here, I'll check the, uh, the status page that's available on the server that shows you who's flying and what the scores are and so forth. And the reason I do that is because as you fly these servers more and more, you sort of learn who's, you learn to recognize some of the names. There are some people that will primarily do ground attack, some primarily attack bombers, some primarily do anti-shipping. But some guys really specialize in shooting down fighter planes. And also of those guys that specialize in shooting down fire pla fighter planes, there's a subset that really specializes in hunting people down. And so I'm keeping an eye out for those types of people on the server and weighing the benefits of keeping my speed up, which is what I'm doing, versus throttling back for fuel economy to increase my chances of making it to a friendly base. Um, I do recognize some of these names here, and, and some of these people are a threat. So, again, speed up, going fast, very concerned about fuel. You may see our fuel gauge. It's at about the 8 o'clock position from our heading indicator, bordered in yellow. And we are way low on gas, man, to quote Maverick. Uh, that, that needle is on empty. Now, at this point, I'm starting to think about pulling the throttle back to increase my chances of making linger rolls. I'm maybe five minutes away from linger rolls, probably three minutes from linger rolls right now at this speed. So it's not very far, but again, I'm just extremely, extremely concerned about uh, running out of fuel. So checking for enemies, and about this time, or in another minute or so, well, you'll see what's going to happen with my engine. Again, name of the game for now is stay on the deck run the plane hard, keep the speed up, keep checking six, and try and get to linger rolls. Again, the damage to my plane isn't that bad, but if I go down, the rules of the server are, and reality, I suppose, there we go, the engine just quit. So we're pitching up. I want to get to my best glide speed of 280 kilometers per hour. That gives me the best uh, glide ratio, meaning the greatest distance forward for a given amount of altitude, and buys me some time to look for a spot to land. Now, unfortunately for me, this means I am officially shot down, because an enemy aircraft did put rounds into my airplane, and I didn't make it back to base. So, 
while I'm actually going down due to fuel exhaustion, due to the rules of the server, um, and reality to an extent, I suppose, uh, I am shot down and someone else will get credit for, for that kill. And in any case, even if they didn't put rounds into me, you could reasonably call it a fuel exhaustion kill. They kept me busy long enough that I didn't have enough fuel to make it back to base. Now, while best glide speed is 280 kilometers per hour, you want to touch down at a speed much lower than that, preferably below 200 kilometers per hour. The people that made the simulator determined somehow, I don't know how they did this, but determined that if you touch down at any speed significantly above that, the plane will catch on fire. I guess maybe they looked at the design of the airplane, the position of the fuel tank, fuel lines, etc., and came up with that. They're, they may be right, I don't know, but in any case, I'll play the game, and that's what I would do in real life anyway. As a general rule, and this is not flight instruction, but as a general rule in real aircraft or in DCS, if you hit the ground at the landing speed, in the landing attitude, and you don't hit something like a tree or a cliff or a boulder, you'll walk away from it, and that's what's happened here. Sure, the plane's totaled, but I'm okay, and I do like to try and keep my character alive, so to speak. Not that keeping my character alive has any real meaning in DCS, but I do try to fly, at least to some extent, as if I'm really there and I try and survive these engagements, although I certainly put myself into engagements that I probably wouldn't want to do in real life. At this point, new airplane and new plan. I'm flying towards some friendly JU-88 bombers, and I'm very certain that they are going to be intercepted by a well-flown P-47 Thunderbolt pilot, a pilot who's pretty well known on the server, and my only real chance is to sneak up and hit him before he knows I'm there, so you can just watch this as it unfolds. I want to talk more about the whole Eric Brown and P-47 Thunderbolt situation. I just don't think there is any question that the Thunderbolt's mock limit and dive performance was really good, not only because of the sources I already mentioned, but because seemingly all reports from pilots in action seem to point to the Thunderbolt having a much higher dive speed than either the BF-109 or the FW-190. For example, Francis Gabreski mentioned numerous times that the P-47 would outdive the German fighters. Now, Francis Gabreski is certainly as much of an expert on the P-47 as it compared to German fighters in combat as Eric Brown. I went through dozens of encounter or after action reports and couldn't find a single case of a German fighter outdiving a P-47. I often found cases of Thunderbolts outdiving the German fighters, and I even found one specific case in which a Thunderbolt pilot, a First Lieutenant Bostwick, on the 6th of June 1944 was diving after a 109. Both ended up experiencing compressibility, that's specifically mentioned in the report, the 109 didn't pull out in time, but the Thunderbolt obviously did. Now, I realize that these reports were written by survivors, but it's very telling that in every case in which a Thunderbolt pilot is diving against a German fighter, the results are in agreement with what we see from NACA and the other data we have here. So what's the deal with Eric Brown's tactical mock limit of 0.71? Now hear me out on this. I think the standards Eric Brown was using for an acceptable amount of required control force was lower than what everyone else was using. That's the only explanation that seems to match up with all the facts here we have from all the various sources. U.S. fighter pilots went through very strenuous physical conditioning. This is well documented in various autobiographies of Thunderbolt pilots. Eric Brown was a relatively little guy. I don't think he had a lot of physical strength. In fact, he says something to that effect in one of his interviews here on YouTube. This isn't a criticism or an attack on him in any way. In fact, for a test pilot, it may have some advantages. Hanna Reicht, who was a German test pilot during the war, mentioned in at least one case that she thought her relative lack of strength was an asset as a test pilot. By the way, Eric Brown and Hanna Reicht knew each other. Anyway, that, that lack of strength in no way held back Hanna Reich. She even flew the ME-323, along with about every other World War II German planes, and has a great many accolades as a pilot, various firsts and records. I guess my point here is that I think the control force requirements 
for what I'll call Eric Brown's tactical Mach limit was simply lower than what a P-47 pilot could deal with, especially with the adrenaline they're going to have in combat. And the overwhelming amount of evidence is that by normal standards and in combat, the Thunderbolt could outdive any German prop-driven fighter. Now, some may dispute that. I know there are some out there who are just married to Eric Brown's .71 number, and that's fine. But understand, if you're doing that, you are in a sense saying that everyone else was wrong. I just don't think that's a reasonable position considering the sources involved. It's much more reasonable to say that the one person who is the outlier here was wrong. That said, I think my control force explanation makes the most sense. It's possible that they're all correct. This theory is also backed up by some evidence. Eric Brown states in the interview when he talks about tactical mock limits that he could generate a maximum of 60 to 65 pounds of force on the control stick. That's not a lot. In normal types of testing, it wasn't unusual to see 50 pounds of stick force required for published roll rates. In one P-47 manual, it says the dive recovery should be initiated by holding a continuous 50 pounds of force. And although I couldn't find the control force limits used in P-47 dive testing, I did find some extreme examples when they were using 100 pounds of stick force on the elevator more than Eric Brown, by his own admission, could generate. Back to the sim for a moment. After shooting down that Thunderbolt pilot, I made my way across Normandy, and I'm looking to help out an ally, but I'm too low and slow comparatively for this fight, but I'll try anyway. Back to the Eric Brown saga, and this next part is admittedly much harder to reconcile than the tactical Mach number issue itself. For one thing, it's going to be difficult because what he says in an interview that you can find online is slightly different than what's in his book. The two versions don't contradict each other, but the book version has far less detail. According to Eric Brown, U.S. Army Air Force General Jimmy Doolittle, yes, that Jimmy Doolittle, came to the British for help determining mock limits for U.S. fighters. Brown says in his book, quote, the Americans needed urgent help Unquote. His story is that Jimmy Doolittle received reports from B-17 tail gunners that U.S. fighters would dive on the German fighters and then just disappear. Brown implies very strongly that they disappeared because they hit compressibility and crashed. In his words, leaving big holes in the ground in Germany. The British then tested U.S. fighters for both tactical and critical Mach limits, and determined that the P-38s and P-47s were, according to Eric Brown, quote, useless, unquote. That's a term he uses quite a bit for American hardware, and a term I've never otherwise heard used for the P-47 Thunderbolt. He then goes on to say that the P-51 Mustang was the only U.S. plane with a high enough Mach limit to combat the German fighters, and then very strongly implies that it's because of this information provided by the British to Doolittle that Jimmy Doolittle then switched the U.S. primarily over to P-51s and ultimately won the war. I can't find a shred of corroborating evidence to support this version of the story. You would think that if it was true that Jimmy Doolittle would have mentioned this in his autobiography. I mean, that would be a pretty big deal. The P-47's Mach limit was so low that it was useless, and for that reason, Doolittle decided to switch to the P-51s? That would be worthy of mention. However, there's no mention of any of this in his book or any other writings from Doolittle that I could find. Republic aircraft updated P-47 pilot manuals quite a few times during the war, and some of these were done after these British tests, at least three of them that I can think of off the top of my head. Yet there is no mention of a change in procedure or mock limits. So if Doolittle, who was in charge of the 8th Air Force, knew about this information and took it seriously, why wasn't it put into these later manuals, or at least sent out as some sort of bulletin to the pilots? The P-47 was flown at high altitude in Europe by the 56th Fighter Group until the end of the war in Europe, yet we don't see any hint of the .71 tactical mock limit in any documentation for the pilots that actually flew the plane in combat. Again, at least not that I can find. Furthermore, I want to add that I can't find a single picture of a British P-47 with mock measuring equipment on it. Not one. 
now that I think about it, I don't remember seeing a picture of a Spitfire so equipped either, although that would almost have to exist. But I specifically looked for such a picture of the 47. Now I can find many such pictures of Thunderbolts when being tested by NACA, but none by the British. I'm not implying the British didn't do these tests, they did, but I question just how scientific they were. I don't think they had the equipment to do it properly mounted on the U.S. fighters. Now if someone can produce that picture, well then I'm wrong, and I'll add that to the video description, but I don't think it's going to happen. Again, if you can show me a picture of a P-47 in that's undergoing British testing with British mock testing equipment on it, I promise to be really impressed. Now, let's just back up for a moment to the beginning of the story and see if it even passes the reasonableness test. Some B-17 tail gunners saw P-47s dive after some German planes and then disappear. Fine. I don't doubt for a second that Doolittle received reports that said just that. But concluding it's because they hit compressibility and struck the ground is quite a stretch. It's hard to keep an aircraft diving at 400 miles per hour in sight, especially when you're also watching for enemy fighters. It doesn't take long at all for the P-47 to seemingly disappear. If it's moving opposite the bomber's direction, it's going to be a mile away in only five seconds. That's easily, that's without even reaching its maximum dive speed. From the point of view of a tail gunner, sure, the P-47s dove into the flight, or correction, dove into the fight, disappeared, and were not seen again. But it's likely it's because they were simply out of sight, either due to range, clouds, or just out of the gunner's field of view. Of course, the gunner would feel frustration at this. Bomber crews often complained that the fighters left them, but it was the nature of air combat. If P-47s were going into compressibility and crashing into the ground in droves, we would see strong evidence of that from the surviving squadron mate's pilot reports. Some would have seen this happen to their friends. Of course, some fighters were lost this way, no question about it, but fighters of all types. But Eric Brown's version of the story, that it was some huge epidemic, just doesn't seem to hold up to scrutiny. Now, did Jimmy Doolittle really need urgent help from the British, as Brown claims? I really don't think so. Jimmy Doolittle was one of the most famous and accomplished pilots in the world at the time. Not only for the Doolittle raid on Tokyo, but as a record-setting air race pilot and more. That could be a whole video. Other than Lindbergh and Rickenbacker, he was probably the most famous American pilot at the start of the war. Doolittle was not a daredevil, he was a calculating and intelligent person. At this point in our story, he's the general of the 8th Air Force. He can talk to the King of England if he wants to, which he did. He can get the President of the United States on the phone if he has to. Talking to Republic aircraft, NACA, or just his own pilots in the 8th Air Force who were flying the airplane, was certainly not a problem for him. But in this version of the story, he went hat in hand to the British, urgently needing their help. Next, with the results of these British tests, which for some reason he didn't share with his own pilots or seemingly anyone else, he switched the 8th over to the P-51. Also, the dates don't really line up well for this story because P-51s were already showing up for escort duty with long-range tanks before Doolittle took over the 8th. Every source I track down for Eric Brown's story here leads me back to one of two places, his book or an interview with him. Now I do think there's a reasonable explanation for all this. I don't think Eric Brown was lying. We'll talk about this in just a minute though. Let's talk about the simulation. As you guys probably saw, I went into a battle up at high altitude and I'm pretty sure that was a human pilot, although there are not many humans on the server at this particular point in time. It varies throughout the day, and this is a uh, less busy time. In any case, I couldn't get guns on target. I didn't take any hits either, but now I'm over enemy territory. There's anti-aircraft fire coming my way. So the safest thing to do is get down on the deck, full power, cowl flaps closed, and stay low out of enemy radar. I'll also be harder to hit for anti-aircraft fire, harder to see by enemy airplanes. I do think somebody might be chasing me. Not really sure. In any case, I'll keep my speed up here. This tactic, this uh, running away or gaining distance before you turn around and come back in tactic, works pretty well in the 190. It works great against the Spitfire, works okay against the Mosquito, doesn't work against the P-51, and may or may not work against the P-47 depending on how the pilot has the plane configured. But all, 
All things considered, this version of the Anton is reasonably fast down on the deck. It'll generally settle down to about 550 kph. Got a little bit more than that right now because I was going downhill. Now, I did try using this tactic. I should say I was shot down a little while ago, which you didn't see, unfortunately, so good job, Patrick. He shot me down in a Spitfire. He met me at the designated time and place, but he was there at a much higher altitude, and with his energy advantage, I couldn't get any distance, and he was a very good shot and uh, knocked out my engine on the first shot, which happens sometimes. Unfortunately, the video was too blurry to use, so here we are, running away down on the deck. At, at some point, I'll decide if it's going to be safe enough to turn around. So let's talk about this uh, Eric Brown situation a little bit more. So we've all heard, you know, the, the concept that truth varies a bit depending on your point of view. You know, it's like when Obi-Wan said to Luke that Vader killed his father and then later said, well, you know, from a certain point of view. I think that Eric Brown's story is a bit that way. I don't think he's lying. I think that he's telling the story from his particular point of view, and I think from his point of view that's how it looked. I don't know how or when uh, Doolittle asked the British for information on mock testing. I do think that probably happened, but I don't think it was Doolittle going hat in hand saying we urgently need your help. I think he was probably talking to somebody in the RAF or some other British operation, and of course they would have been talking about airplanes, and mock limit was a common point of discussion back then and that probably came up and I imagine that Doolittle said something like yeah well we would like to see your results and then from Eric Brown's point of view the way that story is being embellished before it gets to him uh, it's Doolittle urgently needs our help and then the British did their tests and I've already talked about how they did the tests and, and the results and then Doolittle got the results and the next thing Eric Brown sees from his point of view, because remember, at this point, he's not a frontline combat pilot. He, he Now, he definitely was a combat pilot, and he went through some real trials and tribulations, no question about that. But at this point, he's a test pilot, which, and he was in that position largely because he spoke German. That made him extremely useful. Not only was he a skilled pilot, but he could read all the German pilot manuals and instrumentations and and so forth. So at this point, from his point of view, he sees the Americans are switching very, very heavily to P-51s, the airplane that he and his um, his co-workers that were testing this stuff said to use. So I think from his point of view, it really did look like that. I just don't think that that's what really happened, and I don't see any evidence to support it. So we're heading back into enemy territory. Actually, we're in enemy territory. We're heading deeper into enemy territory. And I can see a couple airplanes up there, and I'm hoping to identify one of them, kill him in the head-on pass, which I have a good chance of doing with the 190A's firepower, and I still have a decent amount of ammo. The only shots I've taken, for the most part, or the only real am ammo expenditure I've had was in that P-47 I shot down earlier. So I'm not sure who's who here, but I'm trying to figure this out. I know one's chasing the other. Okay, so that's a 109. All right, when a 109 is running from enemy territory and running from an enemy aircraft, that's probably a sign that in a 190 Anton you shouldn't keep going the same way, but we're going to do it anyway. I'm pretty confident in my shooting. I'm confident in the Anton's ability to keep me alive, but if I don't get this guy in the head-on pass, that's going to be bad. Notice my speed is low. I throttled back a bit, thinking I'm going to save fuel, and that was a big mistake. So I got some hits on him there, but he got some hits on me. Part of the reason he got those is because I ducked down to avoid the head-on. He took advantage of that, which I get. But now I turn around, and I see there's another P-51, and, well, that's that. Got to bail out. Uh, my hat's off to that P-51 pilot. I'm not sure who it was, but there are only two on the server right now, and it was definitely one of them. That was some amazing shooting, so good job, buddy. Every so often, I incur the wrath of someone here on YouTube. It's not that I care, I'm just pointing it out. On the automotive side, one guy made a really long video about how much he hates me. It's entirely full of lies where he twists the truth about something I said to make it untrue and then attacks me on that basis. It doesn't bother me, which is why I never fired back. I don't seem to attract that same type of negative attention here on the airplane side, for the most part, but the amount of it isn't zero. 
One particular fellow who is an author seems to really have it in for me. He wrote a book on the P-51 Mustang some time ago. One problem with books compared to streaming videos in the modern world is that if you as an author make a mistake in the book and it gets published, you're pretty much stuck with that. You don't have any way to edit all those books that have gone out there. Here in the streaming video world, if I make a mistake, and I do, I can take care of it easily in one of several ways. For minor mistakes, incorrect dates, and that sort of thing, I just add it to the video's description, which you'll see in several of my videos. If it's a more serious error, I address it in a subsequent video. One case I can think of right off the top of my head is when I had to do that because I miscalculated BF109 turn performance due to a manual translation issue regarding best glide speed. Now, in an extreme case, I would just take down the video and put up a correction video, but I haven't had to do that yet. I think because of the lack of ability to do these things with a book, some authors, when confronted with new evidence of what to them is a new reality, just can't handle it and dig their heels in, and that's exactly the type of situation I want to talk about. Before we do that, let's talk about this engagement. I flew my Anton to Brie, Quebec to attack the Allied headquarters there, and I put a statement up on the server that the Allies could read that I was going there to attack their ground forces, and I needed footage for a video, and if anyone wanted to show up and try and stop me, so much the better. A Spitfire pilot took up the challenge, and you may have seen a few moments ago, I put some rounds into him from a decent distance, and then I lost sight of him, and I couldn't figure out what happened to him. It turns out that I had delivered a fatal blow, and he, he bailed out. In fact, once I saw the parachute, which you may be able to see right now. If you don't, you'll see it in a moment. Once I saw his chute, I still wasn't sure if I had shot him down. I thought maybe he bailed out to uh, due to excessive G-forces or whatever. You can see just above and to the left of the gun sight right now, there's his chute. But uh, he revealed in chat, and also I saw in tact view later, that I did, in fact, shoot him down. So... That was good shooting on my part. Now, when you're fighting a Spitfire, you really need to keep your distance from the thing. You need to fly at big circles, stay at very high speed, and you're almost inevitably going to end up in a stern chase situation, and when that happens, you need to get about three kilometers of separation before you turn around and come back at the Spitfire. Don't be too afraid of the head-on pass. You have far more ability to absorb damage and far more firepower than he does. Now, we fast-forwarded, the same Spitfire pilot has come back. He's at a base that's pretty close to Brie, Quebec, so I still haven't had a chance to do any ground attack, but we'll fight him again here. I don't think I got any hits on that pass, which is unfortunate, but my energy state is so high that I'm going to be able to get around and come back in for another attack. Basically the same sort of tactic you saw me use against the P-51s earlier. However, with the Spitfire, it's so maneuverable that you really need to pay attention to your airspeed and keep it ideally above 450, maybe 500 the whole time. Again, if that Spitfire gets behind you and he's in the control zone at with equal or better energy and in gun range, you are going to have a very hard time escaping that airplane. So I'll get another shot in here and maybe try for one more. I have got some hits in on this Spitfire at this point. I'm not sure if it was that one or a previous one, but in any case, now things are not starting are starting to go the wrong way for me. I'm not going to be able to turn with this Spitfire. We're at about equal speed, so I need to start thinking about exiting, and we want to do that when the Spitfire is opposite the circle at a 180 degree point. At this point, level the wings, lower the nose if you can, not too much though, and full throttle cowl flaps fully closed, and keep checking six, because if he comes around and he's in gun range, you may need to jink a little bit, but it's not going to be too hard to avoid his rounds at extreme range. Now we're just going to keep doing this until we've got about three kilometers of separation, and unfortunately that takes a long time. Now some Spitfire pilots will stick to you like glue the whole time, and then it takes forever before you turn around, but don't be tricked into turning around early thinking because they're being tenacious you need to do that. Don't do it. You will take rounds and not get your guns even on target. But if you get three kilometers of separation you will easily be able to make the 180 degree turn even with the Spitfire coming at you at full speed. Line up 
and shoot at him. That's the tactic I'm using here, which means we have plenty of time to get back to our story. Apparently, I upset this one author of a Mustang book in several ways, all having to do with the P-51. To start with, he's upset about my recent video detailing the origins of North American aviation and its ties to Fulker. The short version of that video is that the reason North American went from a company that had never built a single airplane to a titan of aircraft industry in such a short time is because it was built from Fulker. Let me back up for a second. One criticism that I get quite a bit, but which I consider totally invalid, is the accusation that I left something out of a video. The problem is that such an accusation can be leveled at every video ever made. For that matter, any book, report, document, or whatever. Now, it's one thing if something critical was left out. For example, if trying to exonerate an accused murderer, and you left out the fact that the trail of blood went everywhere he went that day, that would be an omission that would probably disqualify your whole argument. However, just because you didn't cover the accused's life story, including every living moment since birth, doesn't disqualify your argument. Yet, that's the tactic I'm seeing here in an attempt to discredit my video. He harps about how I didn't mention General Motors' acquisition of another aircraft company named Berliner Joyce. Have you ever heard of Berliner Joyce before now? I'll bet very few of you have. This was a company that built a total of 75 airplanes through its existence. Of those 75, only 7 were monoplanes and 6 of those were parasols. With all due respect to everyone who was associated with Berliner Joyce, this company is an aviation footnote at best, which is why you probably haven't heard of it. Do you know how many of these smaller aircraft companies have existed over time? There have been about 160 of them, starting with the letter B alone. Yet General Motors bought other companies, but the big one, the big one that mattered in terms of aircraft production, was Fulker. Fulker was one of the biggest aircraft manufacturers in the world at the time General Motors bought them, and was the biggest one just a few years before the buyout. Trying to argue that Berliner Joyce had some vastly greater relevance here is just silly, and posting about my omission of Berliner Joyce over and over in my comments section is just silly. It's a desperate and irrelevant argument. I'm actually recording this at home, and I don't normally do that. Normally I'm doing these videos in hotel rooms. Now, my wife just came over and told me I sound annoyed. I guess I am, so I'll try and soften it down a bit. But I'm only annoyed because I have to waste time on this nonsense because some author is butthurt that his books are obsolete and short on information. I'll put a complaint form up at the end of this video for him to fill out and send in. The next omission-based argument he makes is centered around the fact I didn't discuss the background of seemingly every North American executive involved during the World War II years. Yes. Some of them came from Douglas, some from Martin, and other aircraft manufacturers. However, the key people in design, manufacturing, and testing worked for Fulker. I named three of them in my video by name. They were the head designer of the P-51 Mustang, the foreman of the sheet metal shop at North American, and that's relevant here, and the first test pilot to fly the Mustang. In the early years, the lion's share of workers at North American were from Fulker. Of course, they hired others, but the others learned from the guys at Fulker, who were the old hands at that point. Now, as for the executives, sure, a lot of them came from other aviation companies, but that alone does not come close to explaining the rapid rise of North American. Aviation executives moved from one company to another all the time back then. Actually, they still do. North American was not unique in this respect. I'll ask you to consider two things here. First, North American was not the only General Motors owned venture into military aircraft. Fisher was another. Now Fisher, with all the King's horsemen and all the King's men, the full financial backing of the General Motors treasury and top tier executives, failed. They built the P-75 Eagle. It was high tech, very expensive. Fisher had the political and marketing connections. In fact, if you read stuff from the press, during the period of the plane's development, you would have thought this thing was going to walk on water, but it underperformed and was canceled after only 14 examples were built. The main difference between North American and Fisher 
Both were owned by General Motors, but the main difference is that North American benefited from the experience of the team from Folker. At least that's how I see it. Now, I'm not belittling the executives from North American. They did well, and there were some real heavy hitters in there. But I am saying that the people on the factory floor were making a very significant difference here. And these people are often left out of history. I've shown in earlier videos extensively that both NACA and the British tested the P-51 Mustang extensively. They found that to a very large degree, very large, the P-51's excellent performance came from the precision with which it was built. In fact, the British determined that the reason the P-51 was faster than the Spitfire with a given amount of horsepower, that's an important qualifier here, the reason for that was down to build quality. And had the British been able to build the Spitfire as precisely, it would have been the faster airplane. Again, faster per horsepower. Let's go back to our running battle for a moment here. You've seen that my tactic is to get distance, turn around, try and get a shot in. It works or it doesn't. Maybe try one more time and then run and get some distance again. So that's what I've been doing. And I realize that's kind of dull to watch, but I suspect most of you aren't watching this video for the dogfighting action anyway. This is how you have to fight the Spitfire in the 190. Uh, in fact, it's really have, how you have to fight a lot of airplanes in the 190. Keep in mind, this isn't just a Spitfire. It's a Spitfire Mark 9 LF, which is arguably the best low-altitude one-versus-one dogfighter of the war. Now, there are some Japanese aircraft that might be in the running there, some Russian aircraft, uh, certain versions of the 109, but... Overall, the Spitfire, I, I would argue, is the best 1v1 dogfighter of the war, specifically the Mark 9 LF, at least at reasonably low altitudes. So my only hope here is to play this game. And spoiler alert, at some point I am going to shoot down this Spitfire, and I'm going to do it using this same tactic we're talking about. And once I get some hits, I just lead him on the chase more. And in this case, I'm going to lead him out to water because he's damaged, or he will be soon, you'll see. And when he follows me out over water, I know for sure I'm going to get a kill because when his engine quits or when something fails, uh, he's not going to be able to save that airplane. He's going to have to bail out or, or ditch it in the sea. Either way, the aircraft is lost. So, got some hits there. I'm sure you just saw those. And now I'll, I'll use that tactic of heading out to sea, and this is going to work out. So, although the 190 is absolutely not a great dogfighter it doesn't mean that you can't win with it we'll get some shots here and definitely got some solid hits there and we look back we see that he's smoking so now we'll head out to sea and sooner or later that'll be the end of that Spitfire so overall I think I've shot down five airplanes here three or four of them yeah four of them ended up in the water one, uh, the pilot had to bail out, so all five airplanes I shot down were utterly destroyed. I've been shot down, let's see, I guess it's uh, twice. One time I ditched, and the plane was not salvageable, but I walked away, and the other time I parachuted away. So the 190 can do a pretty good job against enemy fighters and can keep you alive if you fly it this way. It's not really the way to use this airplane. What I really should do is ignore the Spitfire and just keep flying straight ahead and look for enemy bombers to shoot down. That would be the prudent thing. But again, I put up a challenge for somebody to meet me, so I've got to stay in this fight until it's finished. Let's get back to our main topic. One argument against my North American Origins video is that I didn't put all the evidence on screen, which I normally do in my videos. The reason I didn't do it in that particular case is because it only takes a kindergarten level of internet usage to verify everything I said there. You can simply go to the Wikipedia page for Anthony Folker and start your journey there. You will find that he went to the United States in the early 1920s and started building airplanes in the U.S. His company changed names a few times. At one point it was called Atlantic Aviation. Look that up. It will lead you to the General Motors buyout. Look up North American. Same thing. The fact that North American was a holding company and not an aircraft manufacturer before the buyout is very easy to find. Anyone who cares to can follow the trail of breadcrumbs I left and verify everything I said. Next topic. The other issue this particular author con just constantly attacks me on is in regards to P-47 Thunderbolt range. I made a whole video on that subject. 
If he was butthurt that he missed the Folker connection in his book, he is downright livid about the fact that the P-47 did in fact have enough range to escort the heavies almost all the way to Schweinfurt for the raids there, and it was only due to bomber mafia negligence that the heavies were left so vulnerable. Shortly after that, the P-47s had enough range to escort bombers to any target in Germany. Of course, that goes strongly against the standard narrative that he and others have been falsely reporting for so long. That's the narrative that only the P-51s had enough range for escort duty. His argument changes constantly. He started off by pointing out that the early Thunderbolts didn't have provisions to pressurize the drop tank. Now that's true, but irrelevant. The early type tanks did have a limitation there, but it's just not an insurmountable problem. A relay system of escorting could be used and was used. In other words, while one group of 47s is with the bombers up high protecting them, the next is down around 10,000 feet until the fuel in the drop tank is exhausted, and they then climb up to relieve the first group on escort duty at the rendezvous point. In fact, even later, when they did have pressurized drop tanks on long-range missions, they would still do this because the plane's best range with drop tanks is at relatively low altitudes, as low as 5,000 feet in some cases. That has nothing to do with whether the tank is pressurized or not. This is specifically discussed in the P-47 November manual, which was the final version. It's covered in the earlier manuals via the performance charts, although not explained in plain text as it is in the later manuals. So I understand how someone could miss this, especially someone who's not extremely familiar with aircraft. So in the early version, the lack of a pressurized drop tank just was not a total deal breaker. However, and this is a key, key point, it doesn't matter because the first version of the P-47s with a system to pressurize the drop tank and of course mounting points and the related components were in Europe well before the first Schweinfurt raid. This guy's entire non-pressurized fuel tank argument is invalid, and I think he knows that, but is just using it as a distraction to spam the comment section. On that subject, he is on a two-month ban, which is almost up. Hopefully he behaves himself if he comes back, because he is a knowledgeable guy when he can put his jealousy and other issues aside. Now, he has a third argument. When one of his arguments is disproved, he just move seamlessly to his next flawed argument. Now this one really takes the cake. He argues that the lack of drop tanks had nothing to do with poor decision making by the bomber mafia and everything to do with technical and logistical limitations in the United States. Now it takes quite a bit of mental gymnastics to conclude that U.S. industry, the very industry that built the P-47 Thunderbolt, was incapable of building drop tanks in 1942 and that the delivery of drop tanks to Europe was somehow an insurmountable problem. Let's start with the technical challenges. Drop tanks have been around for, they had been around at this point for a long time. It's essentially just a streamlined tube with some fittings on it. The British designed and built one of these things out of paper mache in a matter of weeks. All sorts of factories in the U.S. had the ability to produce metal drop tanks. Many were built by automotive muffler companies. Nearly all Thunderbolts in Europe had the provisions to carry them. Adding the pressurization system for the tank was not a big deal. The plane had sources of air pressure that could be tapped into. All Thunderbolts had that. The D5 model simply used the exhaust side of the vacuum pump for this purpose. A T-fitting, a hose, and a valve is about all that was needed. All Thunderbolts had this from the D5 model and on, and those were in service before the first Schweinfurt raid. And the dates I'm using for determining when these things showed up and when they, when they came into service are from the 8th Air Force Tactical Development Book, which is not exactly a source friendly to my claims. And I mention that because uh, this particular author always attacks my sources and says that my, the source I used, Robert S. Johnson in one case, said that he was just wrong. Um, but I'm using other sources, and again, sources that are not even friendly to the case that I'm making. In short, the only reason P-47s were not equipped with drop tanks to escort the U.S. bombers is because of the decisions made by the U.S. Army Air Force leadership at the time. Once they changed their minds, drop tanks started showing up by the boatload in a matter of weeks. Kami time. We're in the MiG-19 here. It's one of my favorite Cold War jets. However, I haven't been flying it much lately in DCS because an update to the module, in my opinion, ruined the flight model. If it's ever fixed, I promise I'll do a full review of it, and when it's right, it's one of the most fun planes to fly in DCS. 
The reason I'm flying it now is because I want to talk about Soviet cannons. It seems I upset some people in one of my IL-2 videos. I said two things that are apparently controversial. First, the 37mm cannon was not a great air-to-air -air weapon, and the Soviets kept using it because they were essentially in love with it. During the Second World War, most nations used 37mm cannons in some sort of air-to-air -air application. These were generally unsuccessful. That doesn't mean they never shot anything down. But the 37mm idea did not really take off, and most countries went to or went back to cannons in the 20mm to 30mm range for air-to-air -air work. However, the Soviets kept on using these after the war and installed them in MiG-15s and 17s. Both MiGs were equipped with a single 37mm cannon with only 40 rounds per gun. They also had dual 23mm cannons. Now, when a MiG-15 or 17 shoots down an enemy airplane, it's hard to say which gun did the damage, but I suspect against fighters it was almost always the 23s. The low rate of fire of the 37s and the low ammo count would make it very difficult to hit a fighter. Not impossible, and I'm sure it happened, but probably not often enough to justify the weight of the gun. The 37mm cannon was about two and a half times the weight of the 23, with about half the rate of fire. I think that for anti-fighter work, they would have been better off without the 37s or with an extra 23mm in there instead. Now for anti-bomber work, the 37mm may have had a place. It's hard to say because MiG-15s in Korea only shot down at most 16 B-29s. Of those, at least one was shot down by a MiG-15 firing rockets. And we don't know how significant the 37mm cannons were in these engagements. However, the B-29s shot down 16 MiG-15s, so it doesn't seem that the 37mm cannon gave it some huge advantage here by enabling the plane to stay outside the range of the B-29s gunners. Whatever the case, the Soviets soon followed everyone else and abandoned the 37mm as an air-to-air -air weapon. If you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. And consider joining my Patreon. Patreon members often get early access to videos. They get access to many aircraft flight manuals and other historical documents and get to vote in polls, which help determine the direction of the channel. We're over Tinian. You can see the smoke there where the Saab Vigan we uh, shot down has crashed. And we're right over the airport where the Enola Gay took off from in Boxcar on their atomic bombing missions. This is modern day Tinian, so the airfield is quite dilapidated. Only one of one out of the four runways is operational. We took off from Saipan, and now we're going to hop into a new MiG-19P to defend Saipan against the Dutch menace. Some very early, in fact, I think pre-production MiG-19s had 37 millimeter cannons, but these were quickly abandoned. Some early MiG-19s had 23 mils, probably because they figured out those were far better for anti-fighter work than the 37s, and they were developing air-to-air -air missiles, which should be able to handle bombers. They then replaced those 23 mils with dual 30 mil cannons, which are what we have in this MiG-19P model. Now, in an earlier video about the IL-2 Sturmovik, I pointed out that at this point in time, the Soviets started to fall behind in aircraft cannons, and I stand behind that statement. I mentioned this airplane specifically, that is the MiG-19P, which is an earlier variant, although by this point the design had gone through a number of changes, including at least three armament changes. It's clear that by this point the Soviets had given up on that 37mm idea. Now as compared with the US F-100 Super Saber, the MiG-19P is behind in cannon armament. The MiG's 30mm cannons have good weight of fire about 20% more than the Super Saber, but the total rate of fire from the MiG's two cannons are less than one-third that of the Super Saber's four cannons, and with much lower muzzle velocity. Thus, it will be much harder to score hits with the MiG. Keep in mind, this is in 1955 when the MiG has only two cannons. Yes, later versions of the MiG have three 30 mils, but in the video I was specifically talking about this model, which has two. Some of the commie bros who got upset missed this important fact. Now, with three cannons in the later versions, the MiG had an even greater weight of fire. 
but still had far fewer rounds going down range and with much lower muzzle velocity. it's going to be hard to hit with these things i think that the super sabres revolver cannons were superior and certainly more advanced in nineteen fifty five the us was ahead here maybe you can make an argument that the three cannon mig nineteen had an edge in firepower for a short time but i don't think so and even so that is an advantage by putting in more guns not a advantage in cannon technology but it doesn't matter because by 1959 the u.s vulcan cannon went into service and the soviets never caught up to that it's the way i see it the soviets were falling behind in aircraft cannon technology certainly by 1955 and without question by 1959. next i want to talk about the performance of soviet aircraft in general not any specific airplane but the general state of soviet aircraft performance from say 1942 when the better Soviet fighters started to come on the scene in significant numbers, up until the MiG-25, which became operational in 1970. If we pick a Soviet fighter at random from anywhere in that time period, its performance specs will probably look pretty good. Yet when we look at its record in combat, it's usually not nearly as good as its performance numbers would suggest. Very often this is blamed on variations in pilot skill. And in some cases that's a factor, but in others it's absolutely not. There are factors going on here that are difficult to quantify and are often not discussed specifically for that reason. First of all, most Soviet aircraft engines were not built for long life. Their piston engines in World War II were intended to last no more than 100 hours. They would be wearing out rapidly every time they flew, meaning the performance was decreasing with every flight. It's likely that the flight test data came from planes that were put together with some extra care, and even if they were chosen at random from the factory, they were still new airplanes. The actual airplanes in service likely didn't perform nearly as well just due to engine wear. Soviet spark plugs in certain applications had very short lives, needing replacement in as little as five hours of use. With a 14-cylinder radial, it's likely that at any given time with a plane that's been in service, it has at least one cylinder that's down a bit on power due to a spark plug issue, even without any engine wear. When the Germans tested an LA-5FN, the performance numbers from that test were way short of the Soviet numbers, almost 40 miles per hour slower at sea level and about 50 miles per hour slower at altitude with lower climb rates as well, much lower. There's a lot of speculation on the internet about why the numbers in the German report are so low. I don't think they are. I think the numbers are probably right for a 5FN with an engine that's used up about half of its service life with a weak spark plug or two. In other words, what was probably a pretty normal frontline 5FN. At the other end of the time spectrum here, we have the MiG-25. Yes, the MiG-25 really could go Mach 3.2, and I think to this day, it's one of the fastest fighters to ever be produced in significant numbers. I think the fastest. But every time it did that, every time a MiG-25 went Mach 3.2, its engines turned to junk and had to be scrapped. So in practical terms, I don't think the Soviet fighters had quite the performance they had on paper. Thus, the difference in performance with a German or U.S. aircraft wasn't really what the statistics would indicate. However, I think the bigger issues hurting the Soviet aircraft in combat have to do with factors that are not normally considered at all in aircraft stats. For example, again, and I'm speaking generally about U.S. and Soviet fighters, the U.S. fighters had heaters and cockpit ventilation. The German fighters usually had electric plugs to heat clothing, electric gloves, socks, or whatever. The Soviet fighters had nothing. The pilot just had to be cold. Manipulating all the controls in a plane with heavy gloves on is awkward, especially during the stress of combat. The U.S. fighters had parking brakes. The Soviet fighter pilots would have to hold the brakes manually. The U.S. fighters had attitude indicators in World War II. The Soviet fighters didn't. That makes it pretty tough for Soviet pilots to fly in low visibility conditions. U.S. or German pilots could climb or dive through clouds with far less concern than their Soviet counterparts. On that subject, once the Soviets did get attitude indicators in their planes, they were confusing to use, as is the case in this MiG-19 I'm flying. 
You may have noticed that pitching up moves the plane symbol on the indicator lower on the horizon, opposite of what you would expect. That's because it's just a gyro fixed in space and the airplane moves around it. U.S. attitude indicators have a mechanism to correct for that, so the pilot sees what the plane is doing. In fact, the entire cockpit of the MiG-19 is a mess. When trying to navigate on instruments, you will often have to turn your head so far to the left or right that your flight instruments will be out of your peripheral vision. Certain things can't be done by feel, like tuning the navigation equipment, so you have to look away from the instruments for a long time. This makes instrument flying in this airplane quite difficult. Back to the World War II stuff. Some Soviet airplanes had canopies that couldn't open above certain speeds. The result was that pilots would open them so they could bail out if needed. They would just fly with them open. That hurt the aircraft performance as well and made it very difficult to communicate by radio. That's, of course, if the plane had a radio, and they often didn't, and when Soviet planes did have radios, they were usually of poor quality during the war. There was another reason Soviet pilots often flew their fighters with the canopy open. These planes tended to leak carbon monoxide into the cockpit. That's a big problem. Even with ventilation, you will still breathe some in. And carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide, that's another thing, people get those confused, but carbon monoxide is poisonous and affects your blood's ability to carry oxygen. So over time, it will reduce the pilot's ability to perform. It will reduce vision, G tolerance, and more. When you stack these factors up, all of the sudden the LA-5FN, which is vastly superior to an FW-190A5 on paper, isn't performing nearly as well. Its engine has some wear, maybe a bad spark plug or two, the canopy is open, and the pilot is suffering from cold and carbon monoxide poisoning. Now add in the fact that those FW-190 pilots are talking to each other on the radio and can hear each other, and the LA-5FN's performance advantage just isn't going to amount to much. I want to make some videos about Soviet aircraft at some point in the future. Of course, I'll have to finish other things I'm working on first, not the least of which my IL-2 series. At some point, I want to cover the LA-5, the I-16, and some of the jets. I do think there's an impression that these planes were better than the reality suggests. I think part of that comes from the flight sim world. In the simulator, IL-2 Sturmovik, not the actual plane, but the sim, the developers tend to use relatively high test results for any of the Soviet airplanes. When there is a gray area or something about the plane which is subjective, they give the Soviet plane the benefit of the doubt. This combined with the fact that you're not sitting in the cold wearing gloves and if on comms it's via an internet connection that's crystal clear without 300 miles per hour of wind from an open canopy right by your head and certainly without carbon monoxide poisoning. The overall effect is that people from the flight sim community have an expectation of these planes that I think is just a bit beyond reality. This video is getting pretty long. I can talk all day about this stuff, but at some point I have to stop. It's time. I'll let this fight play out. I hope to see you again in the next video. Goodbye and have a great day.